All right. Well, welcome to a Polar Connect event with Lucy Coleman uh, down at McMurdo Station. She and her team are there, having come back in from the Dry Valleys, uh, doing their work. They'll talk more about it throughout the event. But they're here to tell us a little bit about their expedition, what they were learning, and what it was like. So thanks for joining us. So I'm going to move us through some slides here. You should see slides changing on your screen. And if you're following through the PDF by phone, we're on the second slide that is, says Blackboard Collaborate. Talks a little bit about the uh, platform we're using online today. So slides should be changing. Let us know in the chat box if they are not changing for you so we can try and troubleshoot. But on the far left of your uh, computer screen, you'll see a, a black box as the audio video panel. We likely are not using video today as the connectivity of McMurdo is pretty, pretty slim. Um, so we've got Lucy on the phone. And then if you are interested in talking uh, and asking a question at the end of the presentation, you can hit the talk button to talk and then press it again when you're done. There's the participant panel. You can see who's participating at the moment online. And there is also a chat box in the bottom left. So if there are questions to be relayed to the research team while they're presenting, our staff will kind of nicely interrupt and um, throw in a question from the chat box. If you are on the phone and you have a question, you can just um, gently interrupt as well or wait to the end. We should have plenty of time for questions. So right now, Janet is in the chat box, and she's just mentioning to folks to mute computers to reduce any feedback. Um, for those online, remember, Lucy can't see anything going on in the chat room, but we'll relay everything we can. So the next slide is participant introductions. Uh, so if you're online, please type your name and your school or institution and the number of folks participating with you. That will help us know who is out there. And Lucy will relay that to you as we see it come through. And a quick, introduction to, great, a quick introduction to the Polar Check program. So that's what Lucy is a part of. She is working in a professional development experience for K-12 teachers paired with researchers in the Arctic and Antarctic to study polar science and bring it back to their classrooms. And for the last decade or so, we've been sending teachers out to the field to work together. In the last five years of our grants, we've sent nearly 70 teachers out into the field, and they're bringing that information back. A couple folks are certainly letting us know a little bit about who is with them. So we've got Joe Wood and everybody at Natomas Charter. Uh, the seventh and eighth graders are attending, and there are 325 kids there. And we've got uh, David Martinez from the Kansas City Zoo with seven folks with him. We have Joan Boyle from uh, La Jolla Elementary in San Diego with 24 super scientists. Um, so that's uh, an elementary school in San Diego with Joan. And then we've got Don Sumner online and maybe still on the phone. And one more slide before we turn it over to Lucy, just a reminder about questions. During the presentation, you can type your questions into the chat box, and we'll relay them to the team. At the end, there's the opportunity to ask questions live. So um, in the online system, there's a little hand icon in the participant window. You can raise your hand, and we'll call on you, and you press the talk button to speak, and click it again when you're done. But that's our basic introduction, and we're going to turn it over to Lucy. So Lucy, I am on your first slide that says microbialite in Lake Joyce. Fantastic. Um, so greetings, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you this morning, and I'm excited to be sharing our project with all of you. Um, I'm in McMurdo Station right now, and um, I've returned from the field um, a couple of days ago, and um, would love to share with you what we've been up to. So um, I'd first like to introduce um, our team. Um, and this is slide seven. Um, so I'm here in the office of the Curry Lab with Tyler Mackey, our team leader and geologist from UC Davis. Um, with me is Megan Kruiser, who is a microbiologist um, at UC Davis. And we also have another microbiologist, um, Dr. Ann Youngblood. We have research assistants Justin Lawrence and Sasha Liebman, who aren't with us right presently. 
Um, Dr. Ian Hawes is an aquatic ecologist who lives in New Zealand, and then there's me. And um, for most of our field season, we were together um, for the, the last couple of months. Um, Ian and Ian had a little bit shorter times with us, um, but they're part of the team too. Um, so our and real quick, I yeah, I think I heard someone just uh, sign in by phone. Did someone else just join? Hey Lucy, this is Catherine Green. <laughs> hey Catherine. Great, thanks um, for joining. Um, and so yeah, we've got slides you. going. We've got slides going online. Uh, Lucy's on the team picture slide, and I believe we're headed to the next slide. So Lucy, when you're ready, just say next slide, so I'm sure uh, to move forward. Okay. Sure, no problem. So um, our journey began in California, and we flew down to New Zealand, which is kind of a staging area for um, travel to and from Antarctica, and specifically to McMurdo Station. So from New Zealand, we flew on a C-17 cargo jet to McMurdo Station, which is the largest station in um, Antarctica. Um, next slide. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a view of McMurdo Station from the air. Um, during the busy summer season, it hosts about 1,200, 1,300 people, which includes support staff and also uh, researchers. We were really lucky to arrive um, on the C-17 flight that we were on because travel before that date and after that date was pretty much shut down for like about a week on either side because of poor weather. And um, so while we were here at McMurdo, we experienced some of that poor weather and we, we spent a little over a week here kind of rushing around getting all of our gear ready for the field season. And um, we also had a few days extra in McMurdo because of poor weather. Um, we, we needed to fly by helicopter to the Dry Valleys, which was where our field um, season was based. Um, and it just took a few days for the weather to clear out. So during that time, I was able to introduce uh, you to some more researchers that are doing cool work here at McMurdo. Um, but we were pretty anxious to get our field season underway, and we're really glad to be offered a flight one night <laughs> um, by helicopter out to Lake Joyce. Um, next slide. Um, so Lake Joyce is in the dry valleys of McMurdo or of Antarctica. It's, um, where we were was about an hour's helicopter ride from McMurdo Station, but it really felt very um, very isolated and um, and removed from civilization. Um, if you look around the camp photos, you can see that the dry valleys are very, very dry. There's hardly any precipitation because the mountains that surround the dry valleys kind of block um, storm systems from moving in from the ocean. So it's very rocky. Um, a lot of people say that it's uh, the closest thing that you can get to being on Mars without actually going to Mars. <laughs> um, and this was where our remote field camp was. Um, oh, and I should say a little bit about the weather. Um, our field season was colder than we had expected. And um, there were days that were sunny and bright and beautiful, but also many cloudy days also, um, as well. And um, I would say the temperature was between about 10 degrees to 25 degrees in that range for pretty much the whole time we were there. Um, it snowed a couple of times, which is pretty remarkable because the dry valleys are so dry, it only gets about a centimeter of average snowfall per year. And I think we got a lot of that during the time we were there. Um, so you can see our remote camp um, in this slide and some of our tent structures. We had a pretty big endurance tent that was maybe 20, 25 feet long. Um, that was our main living space and our cooking and eating space. And then we each had a personal tent that could hold two people, but we were just in them with, um, we had tents to ourselves. Um, the white boxes in the view are um, for storage for um, a lot of our frozen foods and some of the gear that we weren't using. You can see an antenna for our communications device there in the photo. 
And um, the pyramid-shaped tent is, um, is our, was our bathroom. And a lot of um, folks are wondering how we got our water and, um, and dealt with waste. And um, when we're in the dry valleys, we needed to practice what's called leave no trace camping, which is where, I mean, it kind of is what it says. You leave no trace that you've been there. So we needed to um, camp lightly, um, not leave any waste behind, and that included human waste. So those big black barrels outside the Scott tent there, outside the pyramid-shaped tent, are for wastewater. And that's for, um, like, wastewater from our cooking as well as um, urine, too. So that had to actually be flown out with us. When we could get our drinking water from the lake, um, once we melted the dive hole, which I'll tell you about in a little while, we could get most of our water from that. But for a while, we were chipping ice and having it um, melt, and that was our drinking water um, for the time we were out there. Um, next slide. Thanks, Lucy. I'll move to the next yeah. slide in just a second. I just want to update you on yeah. things that are going on in the chat box. So people are talking about the snow in the dry valleys. And people were really curious how much snow you got. You mentioned that, you, that it only gets about one centimeter a year, it sounds like. And you were there during the snowiest time Don was mentioning. So uh, um, folks were talking about this. There was a student named Cole that was asking. And Don said, the total snow for the whole year is less than an inch. And there is never any rain. So, did you feel like you were in any sort of snowstorm or just a little bit of snow? No, it, it, it actually I should clarify that. I mean, it snowed, but it was really flurries. It was enough to give everything just a very light dusting of snow um, and enough to leave, um, you know, sled tracks on the, on the lake ice. Um, but it didn't, it didn't last very long, and it kind of, it was very, very fine snow. Um, one other thing I should add about the weather, too, is that it's really, really windy. So it was, you know, we could hear the snow kind of pelting a little bit on the tents at night, but we also had some very um, terrific windstorms that, that actually sounded like it was more pelting gravel on our tents, <laughs> which was um, quite an experience. Wow, thanks. So for the folks that have just kind of joined in the last few minutes, um, we do have Dawn Sumner online. She is one of the leads for this project, but she's in California while the rest of the team is in Antarctica right now. She's helping to kind of ask questions and answer questions. And a couple other uh, educators and folks have joined. So thanks for joining. And um, we have Lucy and the team on the phone. Connectivity wasn't perfect at McMurdo this morning, but we've got everybody connected. So Lucy, I'm going to turn it back to you. And I've got your slide that says Lake Joyce with two folks in uh, the Big Red Parkas. Right. So we, um, our camp was kind of up on a, um, a ridge above the lake, and every day we would hike down to Lake Joyce and spend most of our, our days on the lake. Um, the lake was beautiful. Um, it's about a kilometer across from one side to the other, and um, in this view you can see Taylor Glacier in the background there. And that's just a small portion of Taylor Glacier. The thing is huge. and um, and it was kind of funny to be kind of in this bowl looking at the same view every day and not, like we were just so isolated in our, our little lake area there. Um, the lake itself is covered with about four meters of ice. And um, that's where we spent most of our days. So you can go on to the next slide. Um, as I said, the lake is spectacular. And um, it's surrounded by mountains. And this is where we spent most of our time. Um, we had um, the blue tent there called the Polar Haven, which was our lab tent. And um, the lake had a lot of topography caused by um, sediment that had drift, drifted onto the lake or been blown there. And then um, during the summertime, the, in the wintertime, there are freezing and thawing cycles. And the sediment causes that to happen unevenly across the lake. And so in some places, the lake was very, very flat and easy to walk on. But on other times, you kind of had to navigate around some pretty big ice structures on the lake that were just beautiful. 
Um, and when you look down at your feet in the lake, you can see all kinds of different views. Sometimes the lake would be, um, or the ice would be milky and kind of chunky. Other times it would be really blue and clear, um, showing very dense ice. Um, sometimes you could see pockets of sediment um, right under the ice. Um, and it was just a beautiful place to be. Um, as I mentioned, we spent a lot of time on the ice. And, um, and that often means, um, and you can go on to the next slide. Um, you know, we had only um, our own power to travel around the lake, so and we had a lot of gear. So we um, traveled with sleds nearly everywhere. Sometimes toting a small sled, but sometimes toting a sled um, with quite a lot of equipment, which could be really challenging, especially if we were going over the really rough ice. And um, it was like a daily CrossFit workout, which was fun. I didn't mind it. It was, it was an adventure. Um, before we went down to Antarctica, Tyler had warned me, he's like, you're going to spend a lot of time on your knees on the ice. And, um, and that was true. I did spend <laughs> a lot of time doing a lot of everything on my knees on the ice. So I included a picture of that too. Um, next slide. So we're here, in, or we were here in the, the dry valleys at this lake because of the microbial mats that are in the lake. And so um, oftentimes when people see a picture of something like the top of Lake Joyce, they think that it's really a pretty inhospitable environment. And, that, and originally, um, people have thought that really nothing could live or thrive in these lakes. And, um, Several years ago, many years ago, people actually drove through the ice and dove into the light, the ice, um, or dove into the lake under the ice and found these incredible microbial communities that are living on the bottom of the lake. And they're they're remarkable for a few different reasons. First of all, we didn't expect for them to be there, um, and second of all, because they're so isolated they have a chance to grow and thrive in an environment without any predators. So the, um, the lakes and the dry valleys are, are so isolated that there, you know, there's no sea life that can reach here pretty much unless you know, it's like a seal or a penguin that goes the wrong way and you know, they head towards the mountains instead of the ocean. But even in our area, it was so far away from the ocean, we didn't even see those, those kinds of wildlife. So, the microbial mats that are thriving in Lake Joyce are um, allowed to kind of grow much as they might have um, early on in Earth's history. And for that reason, we're really interested in these bacterial communities and the unusual shapes that they form and what they can tell us about Earth history. Um, next slide. So the, the mat communities are dominated by cyanobacteria. And um, cyanobacteria are um, thought to be the first, some of the first oxygen producing photosynthetic organisms. Um, and there's a mistake in the slide here. It should say billions of years ago. We aren't entirely sure that it's 3.5 billion years ago. So sorry about that. Um, but these bacteria are super important because of their photosynthetic abilities. and um, transformed the Earth's atmosphere early on in Earth's history to um, allow for the accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere, which you know, we all are benefiting from billions of years later. Um, next slide. Hey, Lucy. This is Sarah. I was just going to pass on ah. some of the conversation happening in the chat. Um, folks are just Great. talking about how beautiful the scenery looks. Um, Don was mentioning that the tent is actually on, your tent was on the lake ice and the sand was being blown around, like onto the ice. Um, and uh, we were talking about how you must be in incredible shape having dragged all that stuff around. And then uh, Don just uh, mentioned, like, the pictures show what's really special about these lakes. They're both beautiful and scientifically very interesting. Just wanted to keep you in the loop. Oh, and uh, a question you. came in. From Janet, so the long mats in those photos of the lake bottom, what are they made of? Algae? So they're made of cyanobacteria that grows in communities. And um, a lot of the, 
a lot of the bacteria is um, like made of filaments that um, can help it to form structures, but there's also calcite inside the um, the communities that you know that allow them for them to form those shapes. Um, yeah, and sometimes the mats grow in, in more flat mats and um, gases in the mats cause them to like bubble up and peel off. And sometimes that's how you, it forms the, um, the shapes that are more vertical in orientation. Very cool. Thanks. I'm going to let you uh, jump back in and I'll put it to the slide on cyanobacteria. Okay, um, you can move on to the next slide after that, actually. Okay. Yeah, so we are interested in these mats because of what they can tell us about um, Earth history. So for a lot of Earth history, there were only microbes living on our planet and very few more complex organisms. And we can see evidence of those um, preserved in the rock record. And um, the, the microbes themselves don't preserve very well, but the communities of microbes do. And so by comparing the shapes of the modern mats that we can observe growing um, today, we can learn more about how to interpret the, um, the rock record and what that can tell us about life on early Earth. Um, because these microbes were such an important part of Earth history and, and really dominated our planet for billions of years. Um, so we look at the, the structures to tell us more about how they grow, um, how they interact with their environment, um, and what they can tell us about past environments or um, perhaps um, in the environment on places like Mars. Um, so we're studying the communities of um, microbes rather than individual species, although we look at that too. Um, next slide. So the team of researchers that I've been working with have been studying the microbial mats for years now, and um, different field seasons are focused on different aspects of the mats. And this field season, our biggest question was how the shapes of the mats was influenced by sedimentation. So we were very interested in um, the wedge pinnacled shapes, which you can see in these pictures, um, because they very closely resemble shapes that we find in the rock record. And, um, and so for this field season, we were focusing on these web pinnacles and the effects of sedimentation. So if you look in the next slide, um, if we take a look above the lake, um, we can see evidence of erosion. Um, so the glaciers that are perched above the lake um, melt a little bit each year when the temperatures warm up in the Antarctic summertime, and they cause water to flow down the, the slopes into the lake. And you can see some evidence of erosion when you look at the hillside. And in contrast, um, so the arrows are pointing to um, some stream beds. If you look over on the left-hand side of this slide, though, you can see that in contrast, there are areas where there isn't um, that evidence of erosion. So we kind of see a range of, of different erosional um, complexities there, I would say. And we were interested to know like how that variability would affect the mats and their shape. Um, so we, we did um, a pretty big, we set up a pretty big experiment to figure that out. Um, next slide. So again, this can help us um, determine um, or help us to learn more about um, those um, the mat or the, the, the structures that are in the rock record, help us understand what early Earth may have been like and what the processes that were operating um, on earlier Earth were like. And um, so that's our, our goal for studying these, um, for asking this question. So, Really, we're investigating kind of the differences between the high areas of high sedimentation and low sedimentation. Um, so we needed to learn a lot, well, learn a few things about the mats before setting up our experiment. And to get to the mats, we, um, we needed to drill an awful lot of holes in Lake Joyce. 
And it was really fun and sometimes very challenging. And um, and in the end, we um, I think we were pretty successful with our drilling operation. So we had um, what's called a jiffy drill, and it um, is pretty. Um, we were using it to punch about five inch, mostly five inch holes down through the four to five meters of ice in the lake. And you can see it's taking out the drill um, there to see how much ice that really means. Um, it's pretty thick and uh, challenging to break through. But once we had a, a hole placed in the ice, we could do our drop camera work, which is on the next slide. So once we had a hole in ice, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so let's see. A question that came through was, what height can the pinnacles get to? And it's actually great. Don's kind of like adding a little bit of uh, commentary as well. And she was mentioning that they grow up to about one foot high. Then pinnacles that are from growth of the bacteria and don't have bubbles are all about an inch or so tall. Uh, Janet was then asking, sort of, do the squares help you measure? And Don said, we want to measure the height and spacing of the pinnacles to compare them to fossils. Does that all sound pretty reasonable to you? That's right. Um, so in some of the pictures, you'll see a little, um, what looks like a checkerboard. And that's just a little device that we place next to the mats so that we have an idea of the scale of the, um, the mats. So that whole checkerboard is probably about five centimeters from side to side. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of how big they are. Perfect, thanks. And then we do have a question from Joan's group. Uh, Jordan is wondering if there are any living organisms in Lake Joyce. So the mats are made of cyanobacteria, and they are alive. Um, so those are microscopic organisms, single-celled organisms that live in communities and form these shapes. Um, there are um, some larger organisms, but they're still pretty small. There are copepods that are about a millimeter big, and those are multicellular. And um, we actually also saw a tardigrade, which was really pretty cool, but it kind of burrowed back into our mat sample before I could get a picture of it. So there are living, living things there, but nothing big or complex. There are no fish, no um, larger animals aside from those copepods, um, which really means that these bacteria can live and thrive without having animals burrow into them or eat them, um, which you know is one of the reasons the researchers are drawn to them. Perfect. Thank you. And I'm uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt each time, but I'm going to go to the slide that says um, eyes on the mat, the drop camera. Is that correct? Great. Yes, that's perfect. Um, so once we placed our drill hole in the lake, we could lower a, a camera into the lake because we, we um, want to see what's down there. And this is the only way we can really do that. So um, the photo on the right shows our, our the camera that is hanging vertically is the one that was connected to our computer that we could actually see with. So above the surface on the lake, we we're holding the camera and we're looking at the field computer to actually see what's down there. And attached to that camera that's hanging vertically is one that's kind of off to the side horizontally. And that was a GoPro camera that was taking higher resolution photographs of the mats. Um, and those were the pictures that we really wanted. Um, but we were using the, um, the vertically oriented camera to see what we were doing. Um, so in each of the holes that we drilled in the lakes, we were um, characterizing the mats, making observations about them with the, the cameras, and noticing their sizes and the shapes that they were forming. And, um, and what we found and what we had been expecting is that the webbed pinnacle mats that we are especially interested in in this field season grow at a particular depth. And so we were, with each drill hole, trying to target that depth to see those particular mats. And we did pretty well with, um, with some help from our um, GIS, Geographic Information Systems Specialist, Sasha. 
And on the next slide, you can see um, the map that he created um, with our um, the information we were collecting. So we drilled over 50, well, we drilled 57 holes in the lake, and at each one we were making observations about what was there. Um, and on this map, you can see the drill sites that we um, created, kind of targeted um, a, what I call a bathtub ring around the lake. So we were um, wanting to hit that 11 to 12 meter depth um, each time we drilled. And sometimes we were a little shallow, sometimes we were a little deep, but overall we got a very good overall sense of the range of shapes in the mass um, because of that work of drilling and doing the drop camera. And um, the map was a huge improvement over what had been documented at Lake Joyce before. Um, we, we created this map with a, a lot of observations, um, but it had been based on a previously hand-drawn map from like 1973. So uh, the map Sasha created here was a huge improvement and helped us um, decide where to put our sediment traps. So um, we can look at the topography outside the lake and see evidence of high erosion and evidence of virtually no erosion. And then with uh, drop camera work, we could characterize um, the mats underneath the lake to see the range of shapes um, within that sedimentation range. So kind of comparing sedimentation with mat shape um, during our drop camera work and drilling the holes. Um, next slide. So um, to answer that question about how sediment affects the mat shapes, we, um, well, Tyler devised an experiment with what we called our sediment traps. And the sediment traps were a device that was about a meter long. Tyler's holding one in, in the sediment trap photo here. And um, it is open at the top and is meant to, um, be lowered down through um, a casing in the ice, um, left in place for a whole year to collect the sediment that falls into the lake during that time, and, or settles into the lake during that time. And then he's going to come back next year and take the sediment traps out and measure how much sediment has collected in each one of them. Um, and this was a pretty I think it was a pretty cool engineering project because there were some constraints we needed to deal with. In particular, we, um, you know, the lake, the lake itself, or excuse me, the lake ice itself has a lot of sediment trapped inside it. And every time you drill a hole in the lake, you dislodge some of that sediment and it falls into the lake. Um, and so he needed to create an experiment that would measure what would be accumulating naturally and not what would be accumulating just because we pushed, you know, punched a hole in the lake. So that was a huge challenge. Um, and in the next slide, you can see kind of some of the steps we took to overcome that. So in the left-hand slide, um, we're, we had drilled a, a 10-inch hole through the ice. So kind of a bigger hole. We placed um, PVC casing around um, into that hole so that we could lower the trap through that after letting the sediment kind of fall out. Um, and then, um, then into that PVC, we put another PVC pipe so that it couldn't fill with ice over the winter time. Um, and basically, that means that next year, what Tyler can do is pull that inner casing of PVC out and not worry about dislodging more sediment that would fall into the traps unnaturally. Um, next slide. Now, this whole process was um, an adventure and an engineering kind of challenge on on the not exactly on the fly, but we had some constraints we needed to work with, and it took a while for us to get the traps to work the way we wanted them to. And it involved a lot of modifications and numerous testings to make sure that the sediment traps were going to collect the data that we wanted them to collect and also be recoverable um, next year um, with the sediment that had collected. 
So it was definitely a challenge, and we felt really good when they finally um, worked right. And you can see kind of big smiles from all of us in the lower left-hand corner when they actually worked. So it was really satisfying to reach that stage. Um, next slide. So we did the experiment, or set up the experiment with the sediment chest, but we also um, did um, some, made some observations in other ways in addition to that experiment. So we had um, Tyler and Ian as divers on our team, and we melted a four-inch hole, in, or excuse me, a four-foot hole in the ice yeah, four inches, um, to send uh, Tyler and Ian down into the lake um, to collect samples and photograph the mats. And by making first-hand observations, they could do kind of more detailed work in a smaller area. And, um, and it was just basically a different way to collect information um, in, a, in a smaller, more concentrated way. Um, they're wearing dry suits because the lake, is, the lake water is just above freezing. And um, they're connected to the surface by a tether that allows for them to receive oxygen and talk with us on the surface. Next slide. Um, during the diving operations, the samples um, that were collected um, are brought back up to the surface. And you can see a, a core tubing um, that Tyler collected of one of the mat shapes on the left. And those are fr um, frozen on dry ice right away after they've been pulled out of the lake. And those will be um, dissected and um, analyzed back at UC Davis. Um, the dive team also collected microbial samples for um, our microbiologists. And in the next slide, you can see their work. Um, so we got um, microbial samples from, um, from the water, but also from the mats. And Megan and Anna will um, remove the DNA from those microbes and analyze the DNA to find out a lot more about um, who's living in this microbial community, um, what genes they have, and um, what genes they seem to need in order to survive, and um, how they're interacting at the microbial level um, with the environment. Um, so that kind of um, summarizes our, our scientific research at Lake Joyce. Each field season focuses on a slightly different question, but there, there are just so many things that we um, want to know about these maps and have different ways of exploring. And um, it was just a really rewarding experience to be a part of the research um, team this, this year. And, and uh, it was just a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. And um, sadly, a couple of days ago, we needed to pull out our, our whole camp. Um, in the next slide, you can see one of the last photos that we took of us, of the whole team in front of Lake Joyce. And um, yeah, we took helicopter flights back to McMurdo with our 11,000 pounds of gear and equipment. And um, right now, we're hanging out at McMurdo. And we're in the process of returning that equipment to various places here on the station. And um, in a few days, we'll be headed back to New Zealand um, for the end of our adventure together. And so that's um, what I had to present. I would love to hear questions from all of you and, and talk about more about what you want to hear about. Thanks, Lucy. That was a great presentation. So for folks that would like to ask questions, um, as I mentioned, there is a hand icon in the participant uh, panel to the left if you're online. And you can click on that, and it'll raise your hand. Um, and so there, and a couple of uh, reminders about questions. You can, uh, when we call on you, you can press the talk button once to speak. Let us all know where you are and, and maybe what grade you're in and your name. And then click it again when you're done asking your question. And then we'll allow uh, Le uh, Lucy and the team to say uh, their answers. There's a couple things going in the chat box here. Folks are saying, fantastic presentation. What a special place. 
John mentioned, 11,000 pounds of equipment, and they had to move it all into piles to send back. Lucy and the others are in great shape. Uh, Catherine Green said, tremendous presentation, very clear and easy to follow for a complex scientific topic. So we're going to jump into questions. So Natoma's charter definitely has their hand up. I'm going to turn the microphone over to them. So go ahead, Joe. So our first question is actually from one of our seventh grade science classes, Mrs. Feeney's class. And they were curious, how will the samples affect modern day knowledge? Do, is there any effect on how this information may impact how we live in the future? That's a fabulous question. Um, so how will, will our knowledge here help us in the future? And, um, and I think that's a, an awesome question for um, one of our, our scientists who are present to, to answer. And, um, and I'd love for you to have a chance to hear from them as well. So, um, and Don can feel free to jump in here too. Um, Hi, this is Tyler Mackey. I am um, the team lead here and a geologist in UC Davis. Um, so I understand the question is about how this uh, work that we're doing now will impact our uh, way that we can think about where we are and um, apply it to our broader understanding. Um, is that generally correct there? Sounds good. Okay, thanks. I'm doing this by second hand over the phone. Um, so the the questions that we're asking are really uh, tied into um, understanding our place on, on this planet. And we are interested in uh, what, what life has looked like um, both now and also earlier in Earth's history. So by understanding these remote uh, ancient, well, these remote sort of isolated places, we can uh, let me dig into some basic questions about um, how did the behaviors that we uh, right now rely on to uh, keep our atmosphere breathable, to originally make our atmosphere breathable, when did those behaviors develop in bacteria? And how can we better understand um, sort of the relationship between microbial communities and the, the planet that we live on? And those are, are really big questions, um, particularly once we start to think about uh, a, what other planets might look like and what interactions with microbial communities could be possible in, in other settings. Um, so if we're trying to understand um, earlier here, it definitely has applications to how we see um, sort of the, the range of possibilities for um, what might be going on in other uh, planetary settings or could have possibly gone on in the past. So if we want to know um, sort of a, a broader view of um, what life can look like, um, it's great to know what it has looked like here on Earth. Perfect. Thanks. And Don is just mentioning a little bit in here, uh, the data from Lake Joyce will help us uh, in the future in several ways. As Tyler said, we learn about early life and how we got oxygen in the atmosphere, as well as what microbes do for us now. So that's a little bit of what she mentioned. Um, and I will actually go right back to Joe uh, if you've got more questions from the time. Sure. Our next question is um, a little bit more personal question for Mrs. Coleman. This is actually from her, one of her fourth period, or second period class, sorry. Um, how have you changed as a person over the course of your trip in Antarctica? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I think that it's definitely made me feel more confident. Um, you know, this is such, um, it was a pretty, um, at times, intimidating prospect to think, like, I'm going to Antarctica and I'm going to be in this really remote camp for six weeks. And the team did an awesome job of letting me know ahead of time of, of what to expect about that. And, um, and I really appreciate that, but it's different to actually do it and go through it and know firsthand what it's like. And um, 
you know, it was it was so fun to be there. Um, I think that a lot of people think that I'm crazy to want to be in such an isolated place without showers and amenities for so long. And it's kind of my happy place, you know. I just um, I I love wilderness, and it was you know definitely a very different wilderness experience. And um, just to know that I could do that was um, definitely made me more confident. And um, and it was just uh, transformative to learn more so much more about how science is done in the field in real life. Um, you know, and it's it's it was just an amazing experience. Thanks, Lucy. And I have got to pass on this comment. Uh, looks like Joan Boyle and the La Jolla San Diego group had to take off, but they wrote in that La Jolla third grade thanks you as we have grown scientifically with this study even at our elementary level. So that is a pretty great compliment. Um, and Joan, do you guys have additional questions? So yeah, we have one uh, sort of related also for Mrs. Coleman. How, was it difficult to keep up with the science knowledge and terminology because of their experience level? And if so, how did she go about um, kind of keeping up with them? That's a great question. And, um, and it was really a wonderful and refreshing experience to be in the position of being a learner in this situation. And um, there were there were definitely times when the team was talking about stuff that I did not understand, and um, you know, it made me realize that it can be sometimes pretty intimidating to say like, I don't get it, <laughs> or I don't know what that word means, <laughs> or you know, can you explain that in a different way so that that I can kind of build it into the framework of what I already know. Um, and and that was challenging at times, but it was also really um, refreshing to know what it, what it's like to feel that way and and learn new things and and um, that and be a part of that process. So, um, but it was definitely there was definitely a lot um, to be learned on my part about um, science, how we do science, and also um, about the particular topic that that we were studying here in this lake. Um, so it was it was fun. It was very fun. Great answer. I was just asking uh, in the chat box if any other groups have any questions. Um, go ahead and put your hand up. And uh, Joe, I put your hand down for a quick second to see if anybody else had any questions. It looks like people are pretty good. If anything comes up, I'll I'll send it over. But uh, Joe, did you guys have additional questions? Oh yes, we have lots, so just let me know when to stop. Um, our, our next question is um, kind of a, a cute, I think, personal one. Uh, what type of subjects do you and the research team talk about before going to bed, especially when you're out in the field kind of studying science all day? <laughs> That's a great question. So um, most of the time after we had dinner and were just hanging out in the endurance tent talking, it was about science. <laughs> so we did science all day, and then in the evenings we would talk about science. <laughs> and, um, and so a lot of our, our evening conversations had to do with um, kind of recapping what we had accomplished that day and also what we needed to do the next day. But also there were many um, long conversations about um, like how we measure what we really want to measure, um, how we can collect the best data, and um, and there were some really wonderful discussions um, between the scientists about about that question. So, are we going to be measuring what we what we really want to? And you know, researchers always have to be careful to not let their own biases affect their work, and not kind of gear their um, their inquiries to get the just get the answer that they're expecting, and so um, and so there were a lot of conversations about uh, along those lines about whether um, about how we collect data and, and go about that. Um, so there was a lot of science. It was science 
in the morning, in the evening, <laughs> all day science, which was really pretty exciting. And you know, you need to keep in mind too that um, the researchers uh, in Antarctica have a very short season during which they can come down here and collect data. So there's this sense of urgency. We're only there for six weeks. It's not like they can come back in a couple of months and collect more data. Um, so it's kind of a, a situation of making hay while the sun shines. And um, and there's, you know, so there was there was science all day, every day. <laughs> yes, and, and Dawn was saying the exact same thing in the chat box. She said, "Imagine that for seven weeks. It sounds like heaven to me." <laughs> so she she and Janet are mentioning that uh, Dawn is definitely a scientist. That's for sure. But she likes doing other things too. She said. Um, and just for a moment, let me check in with uh, folks on the phone. I know there are a few who are muted uh, and listening in. Are there any questions from folks on the phone? If you do want to ask one, just unmute your phone and interrupt at this point if you, if you have something. I'll give you a second. This is Dawn. And I was wondering if um, what your favorite meal was when you were in the field. Our favorite meal in the field. Shrimp. Megan is saying shrimp. <laughs> we um, pesto shrimp was was Megan's favorite meal. You know, I'm, I love pesto pasta, so I, I I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, we we ate pretty well, especially during like the first like nine tenths of the field season when, when we actually had quite a few choices of of what to eat. But but as the field season wore on, we gradually ran out of our favorite foods and started you know eating some <laughs> some sometimes fun combinations that uh, that are definitely not what you would normally eat. But I would agree that shrimp pesto was pretty good. <laughs> What what's the weirdest combination that you ate? <laughs> the weirdest combination that we ate. <laughs> Megan says something Sasha made. <laughs> Sorry, there there. So, but only Ian ate that. So Ian Ian tonight was eating meatballs with guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> and Parmesan cheese. Yeah, it was it was definitely not normal. <laughs> but oh, I bet there are a lot of people smiling right now. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sasha was our one person on the team who would pretty much he wouldn't eat anything, but he was definitely less selective. <laughs> nice. All right, so I'm going to go back to uh, Joe at the Thomas Charter. Do you guys have any questions that can top that one? We'll take a few more. <laughs> well, our last question actually kind of goes back to what Lucy was talking about. We were just curious, from this experience, has the research team's hypothesis either changed or, or challenged as a result of the data that they collected? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so, and I'm going to relate it to the scientists here. So has our, your hypothesis about the system changed as a result of our research this year? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Tyler answer that one. Hello, this is Tyler again. Uh, that is a really great question. And I think our uh, expectations were definitely changing as we entered into this field season. Um, every time that we put in a drill hole, and looked at the bottom of the lake, we saw something new that would help inform our, our hypotheses. And so when we started out, we were looking at sort of what are the broad trends as we go around this lake? Can we see any regional differences in the way that the maps are growing that can tell us about the environment? But as we, as we moved on, we realized that there was a lot of complexity that we didn't really um, anticipate when we were setting up this original experimental design. In parts of the lake, we had um, areas where it was smooth, and then areas where there were pinnacles, and areas where there were webs, and it was just this really 
variable environment. So we were able to find a particular area of the link that we could focus our work on that would allow us to best test the hypothesis. So the, the hypothesis um, largely maintained its, its major questions as we went through the season, but the way that we set up the experiment changed dramatically. And uh, there were a number of mid-course corrections as we were going through the season where we said, okay, let's try this approach and get some more information, put in some more holes, do some more diving, see what we see, and uh, then reassess and say, okay, that might not be the best way to organize our experiment to, um, to test that hypothesis. But it was a uh, sort of living, breathing uh, relationship with the um, observations and uh, the data we were collecting and how we went about um, constructing this field team. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, Joe, did you mention that that was the last question from your group? Yes, that is the last question. But if it's okay, we'd off, we'd like to offer a whole group goodbye, and we'll see you soon to Mrs. Coleman. Nice job, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Nikom. We're starting to school. I can't wait to see you in January. And folks, thanks to all for participating. Uh, we have upcoming events from more teachers in Antarctica. Yamini is headed up to uh, Waste Divide and hoping to come back and do a couple more presentations. And we're sending some folks to South Pole and out on a ship um, in Antarctica soon. So stay tuned for that. Thanks to the team. And I wanted to pass the microphone to all of you on the team there. If you'd like to say goodbye one last time, uh, go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. It was really wonderful to share this with you. And I'm looking forward to talking with you more in person. And, um, and I'm just so glad that you could join us today. So thank you. Um, and the Thomas Charter School, um, thanks so much for following the expedition. And I hope that you still have a lot of questions for me that we can talk about when I see you again. All right, and I'm going to uh, end the recording at this point. Thanks again for participating. <laughs>